scientist at ISI Foundation, and I will be chairing this, uh, this session today. Uh, let me just remind the speakers that we will have uh, uh, 12 minute talks followed by, by two, three minutes of, uh, of questions. Uh, we are starting late because the, the, the main session uh, uh, finished late. We will try to compensate as much as possible for this delay, so do not do not rush. Uh, take take your uh, your allotted uh, uh, time interval. Um, without much further ado, let me introduce the first uh, speaker, Patrice uh, Abri, uh, who will open this session on um, uh, on coronavirus. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sharing one screen. Is this okay now? Yes, I think so. Good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So good uh, Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to, to present this work dedicated to the monitoring in space and time of the COVID-19 pandemia. And this, uh, this estimation is based on convex optimization. It's a, a joint work by a group of people. All of us are located at Ecole Normale Supérieure in Lyon, France, CNRS labs, but from different uh, labs, some from the physics departments, others from the computer science department, humanity department, under the general umbrella of the uh, Institute for Complex System here in Lyon. And as we all know, to monitor a pandemic, very often you use these compartmental models, which are driven by a couple differential equations uh, analyzed by dynamical systems. And if you want some stochasticity, you need to, to resort to likelihood functions and Bayesian estimation, max, Monte Carlo Markov chain too. However, in practice, if you want the model to be realistic, you need many compartments, which means many parameters. And when you are in the context of emergency that we all faced during the, 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 the pandemic, the, the zero pandemic, the data were poor in quality, many missing data or outliers, and there, are, there were only a few, uh, a few, few data available. So that robust estimation on a daily basis based on these models was not really feasible. Instead, we chose to use this phenomenological model proposed by a group of epidemiologists, uh, which can be uh, characterized or said to be a, a semi-parametric model in the sense that it was focusing on a single parameter, the reproduction number of the pandemia, this R parameter, which is when it's larger than one, it means the pandemic is growing. When it's smaller than one, it means that the pandemic is decreasing and it can be related by to SIR, for instance, as the ratio of two time constant of the model. And the key phenomenology of this model is that it says that each daily new infection, like for instance here for French data, can be modeled every day by a Poisson random variable, independent from one day, one day from the other. And the key thing is that the, the parameter of the Poisson distribution is going to be non-stationary. And the way it's non-stationary is where the phenomenology is because it, the, 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 the parameter of the Poisson distribution depends on this reproduction number that you want to estimate. On the previous daily new, uh, new infections counts and on a serial interval function, phi of t, which quantify the probability of being uh, of second infection, basically. The, the probability that given that someone has been infected at day zero, it, it infects someone after a few days. And this, uh, this function phi, this serial interval function is the key, uh, the key uh, epidemiological ingredient in this model. So that the parameter of the Poisson distribution is R of T multiplied by a convolution, a causal convolution between this phi of T and the previous daily infections. When you look at this, uh, Poisson parameter, it gives you this the very, very simple idea to make the estimation. You will, you will say that the estimation of R is just the number of daily infection that you find today divided by this uh, uh, time average here. This estimator is not a, a surprise. It, it's, it can be directly derived from a, a conditional mean, and it's basically a ratio of moving average, except that here the fast average is just, just one day. And the slow average is not chosen at random, but it's given by this function phi, which contains the key 
ingredient from the, from the epi epidemiologist. If you put this at work on any data, for instance, here on the French data, but you can pick any country, you find that estimate, which is not that bad because it says something, but it's, which is obviously super uh, variable, and this cannot be used for any epidemiologist or for any uh, decision maker because it has too much variability. What you could do is smooth this out, but if you smooth a posteriori, um, you will lose um, all the, the time point where you have changes, maybe due to lockdown here or release of lockdown, etc. So instead of, of using an a posteriori filtering, what we are going to do is nonlinear processing of these uh, of these uh, of these data, and instead of doing first um, estimation and then smoothing, we are going to do both the estimation and the regularization in one step using a nonlinear operation, which is, which is built by minimizing a functional. So the functional is going to be, you get an estimate from R by having first a, a term which balances the fidelity between data and model against some properties that you would like the estimate to have. In our case, as we said, the data follow a Poisson distribution with non-stationary parameter. So that the, the natural way to, uh, to assess the data model fidelity is not to use an L2 norm, but a kullback label norm. That's a kullback label divergence that you can write like this, which essentially corresponds to a negative log likelihood. And for the constraint, you want the estimate R of T to be smooth. So what we're going to write is that we're going to write that the second derivative of R, so that we get piecewise linear estimates, as to be uh, as to be sparse. Now the whole point is that you get your estimate of R as the minimization quantity of this functional, and you have to know how to do this minimization, because here you have uh, you have a term which is not differentiable. You have to avoid gradient descent, and instead you have to resort to proximal operator based algorithm. I don't have time to, to detail that, but if you want to know, you just have to look at the, at the details here in the paper. When you get, when you're able to do this minimization, what you end up with is this red estimate here, which you have to compare against the black estimate that you had before using the naive estimate. And obviously, this red estimate, which is piecewise linear, is far more interesting than the red one to, to use, because you can find when it's growing, the change point, when it's decreasing, and etc. Before commenting this curve, however, there is a key parameter to choose here, which is the, 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 the way you want to balance data fidelity versus the, the regularization that you want to impose on the estimate. Obviously, if you let this guy go to zero, you remove this term and you just have the direct estimate, which is going to be super um, uh, variable. To the converse, if this term becomes very large, only these terms will dominate the minimization and you get only one uh, linear behavior across time. So what we what we found out by inspecting the data uh, for many countries is that we find a, a, a blue and a red choice here, corresponding to a slow and a fast estimate from which you get these two uh, these two estimations. So we're gonna now discuss two estimates: the red one, which is fast and which permits to see trends, and the blue one, which is slower and which uh, is, uh, is less prone to, 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 to see changes. This is just the derivative of this R of T, just to see where the changes are. So this is the estimate we, are, we have based on this convex optimization based on proximal algorithm. And these are the results we get. So these are for six uh, European countries. The data are taken from the European Center for, for Disease Prevention and Control. This is a European authority gathering uh, data for 210 country, uh, countries in the world. And here are the estimates for France, Italy, Spain, uh, Germany, UK, and Switzerland. What you very nicely see, for instance, on the French data here is that this is the time where we have the couvre-feu, curfew. And you see that one week after, we start to see the benefits because th this is the end of the, of the decrease in R of T. And then we have the lockdown, which further increase the, um, the, the speed of decrease. But then you see that after a week, the lockdown stopped to provide any benefits in decreasing R. And then uh, even now, it's starting to raise again. And very interestingly, in this last period of uh, since October, 
you see that most of the European countries are exactly having the same pattern here, which probably tells us that beyond the sanitary policies of, of these European countries, which are more or less the same, there is also a global effect maybe to, due to the meteorology, which, which makes such that there was this sudden and violent uh, burst out early October and that now we are not decreasing the, uh, the pandemic anymore, despite the, the lockdown. Um, for, the, for the rest of the world, you see that the USA are still facing a severe uh, increase in the pandemia. Um, um, Australia is, is still controlling the pandemia, but, but, but they are on the, most, most of the countries across the world are on the verge of, 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 of the pandemic. And actually, uh, Japan and, and, North Co and South Korea at the moment are already in the third wave of the, pan of the pandemic. Uh, India has finally controlled the pandemia after uh, struggling out to decrease our of tea for, for a long time. And the Chinese data, well, the Chinese data, there is not much to, 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 to say about. These estimates, we are updating them every evening after the, this European Center for, for uh, Disease Prevention and Control has released the, released the data. Um, and we provide them in the form of an interactive map, which is updated uh, every day. So you can pick your favorite countries and see what's the correct, the, the current estimate of R. And we are also having some um, animated versions, which are currently in progress. So it's not finalized at the moment, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's being Processed and it shows the way the, the pandemic has evolved uh, from the from the early stages of the of the pandemic uh, across time. And again, you can choose your country and focus on the country of interest to see what's uh, what's going on across time. Um, and uh, okay, we did more than that in the sense that there are some countries like France, the U.S., India, where you don't have only. Um, data for, uh, for, one, for the whole country, but also per counties, département in French. So what we need is that we added some kind of, we have the fidel data fidelity term, we have the, the time regularization, and we added the space regularization. The idea is that if you have two counties which are neighbors, uh, their temporal dynamics cannot be very different. Again, you have to find a way to minimize this quantity, which you can do by modifying the previous algorithm. I don't go into details here. And then you get these, these maps of France, which again, we update every, every evening with all the countries and the R of T every day. Again, you can pick any part of France you are interested in and look at the data. Um, and also we have this nice uh, time evolution, which I propose to, to have a quick look. So this is from early March, where the French data were finally available. Now we are in the lockdown period, so you see that France is, is, is becoming green again. Um, and this is the moment where we are releasing the lockdown. And June was the period with the lowest uh, activity of the pandemic in France, but now it's going to be summertime, vacation time. And you see that France is, gr is growing dark again, especially north and on the seaside. And this is August, and you see that France was already uh, quite dark. This is the moment when French authorities took some measures to, to, to decrease the lockdown, which worked for a bit. But then came the October uh, increase, and then the new, uh, the new lockdown. And we are finally improving a bit, but not that uh, we, we're still, a, still around one at, at the moment. Uh, in France. We are almost out of time. Yeah, I am sorry. I am, I am uh, okay. finishing. And just to conclude, what I just want to say also is that there are many outliers, not only on the French data, but on, on most of these data. And these outliers are, are a problem if you want to correctly um, estimate the trends of the pandemic. So that what I have not explained is that in the, in the procedure, we have not only the, the temporal regularization, the spatial regularization, but also a penalization which removes outliers, as you can see, so that we have a reliable estimates for the, the, the behavior of, of the, the trend, the current the trend, trend. So we are performing the denoising, the spatial regularization, and the, the temporal regularization in a single step. Okay.
So basically, uh, concluding, we are still working on improving the uh, the model because at the moment I am tuning by end the, the hyper parameters. Uh, we are trying to produce confidence intervals and we are improving on the interactive and animated maps and working with data from uh, different country, both in time and space. The basics of this has been published in, uh, in this paper at, at plus one uh, here. And uh, the, animation, the, the, the outlier part is still unpublished, it's, it's in progress, and all the results are available on a daily basis, updated on a daily basis on my webpage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we, we don't have time in principle for questions, but I haven't seen yet information from the from the speaker, from the next speaker. Can the next speaker identify? Is the, I, I see a talk. By Dhruv Sharma for the next talk, but I don't see anybody in the room uh, who corresponds to the authors. So in that case, while we figure this out, let's take one question. Um, somebody asks, uh, uh, what is the upper limit of this variable? I, I don't the, know exactly sorry, which variable. The upper limit of R, of the, of the reproduction number? I guess, yeah, I guess. The, the reproduction. Question. Uh, can, can I put it in line? Hello? Yeah. Go ahead. So, so what's the, why why you always find the the smoothed r variable is smaller than two smaller than sorry smaller than two i mean i i, I no 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 it's not smaller than function. two it's just it's just that uh, for um, that, uh, there no, no, no. no r by definition is between zero and plus infinity I yeah, mean, yeah, at, I know that. I know at the that. at the beginning of the pandemic it was larger than one we just chose to plot only things between zero and two or zero and 2.5 because um be, just just to make it easy to see what's happening at the moment. But as you can see at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was above. And for some countries on the, on the map I was showing, it's actually above, above, uh, above, above two. So it's only for plotting the results that we are limiting to zero two. Are there any other questions? If not, what I propose uh, is that we actually drop the second talk that there is none of the authors uh, here in the room. Uh, since we are so late, we will use this gap to compensate for the delay. So we'll restart at uh, six, uh, uh, at 5.10 GMT, GMT time, 6.10 um, European uh, time, Central European time uh, in six minutes. In five minutes, we will uh, we'll start as scheduled with the third talk. And this way we live back on track. And I see the, yeah, I see already the, the presenter of the second and third talk. So see you in five minutes. Can I ask the next speaker to get back to me in private message?
Okay, I guess we can get ready. Okay, I see the next speaker. Can you try and share the screen so we can check that everything is fine? Perfect. Okay, let's wait one more minute. And can you hear me all right? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, I think we can restart with this session. We now move to the third talk. The third and the fourth talk of this session will be presented both by Guillermo de Anda Hauregi, um, who will start speaking right now on uh, facing COVID-19 in Mexico City from network epidemiology to modular economic reactivation. Uh, Guillermo, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sigurd. Um, well, today I'll be, uh, thank you very much everyone for, for coming out today. And today I'll be giving two talks, um, which are kind of in interconnected. The first one uh, I'm gonna be starting by, by talking about this uh, network epidemiology model that we've developed for Mexico City that uh, attempts to suggest an alternative of how to either reactivate the economy, although nowadays it's more or looking like a, some sort of soft lockdown alternative um, to, to balance these uh, effects of the COVID-19 epidemics with the economic uh, issues. So, uh, a little bit about Mexico City. Uh, there are 9 million people living in the boundaries of Mexico City proper. And we're about 22 million people in the general uh, Valley of Mexico metropolitan area. Uh, while I was preparing these slides, I, I found out that uh, unfortunately about 1.7% of all worldwide deaths uh, due to COVID uh, were uh, former residents of Mexico City, which is something that uh, it's alarming to us. And uh, the, the way that we've been handling the pandemic here uh, has uh, needed some adaptations as uh, the efforts to, to battle the pandemic have been different everywhere because the, every city is different. Uh, the major uh, issues here in Mexico is the highly heterogeneous population. And most of this heterogeneity, as we'll see in, uh, in later, it's due to socioeconomic differences. So we, we have very uh, high, le, uh, high income uh, people and very poor people uh, living together around here. So how does, um, how does the pandemic has uh, hit us so far? Well, uh, in Mexico as, as a whole, as a country, we entered a lockdown period uh, at, the, at the end of March. And this lockdown period extended all the way to the beginnings of June. So during this time in Mexico City, the active, uh, the active cases rise uh, steadily and then we hit sort of a plateau. But as uh, after we entered what we call the new normal period uh, officially, uh, we started seeing uh, increases in the number of cases. So uh, the emphasis of the authorities here, uh, it has, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, the local authorities and the national authorities have said that since we have this very uh, uh, heterogeneous distribution of income in the population, uh, we are trying to balance the household economy with the health uh, pre pressure. So uh, the authorities argue that full lockdowns are infeasible because most of our uh, population lives uh, day to day. So if they don't go out and work one day, they don't have, uh, they can't bring food to their homes. So that's our situation. 
So um, the emphasis has been placed on increasing the health services and avoiding hospital saturation. Here in Mexico City, uh, as of late, we've been increasing the testing efforts, even though uh, we can't really do massive testing because the, the resources are limited. So how, do, uh, how has uh, this, this uh, release of the mitigation measures has looked? Well, since we started this new normal period here in Mexico City, we have, have had these moments marked in, in blue lines where we have relaxed the mitigation measures, and every time that we have, uh, and every time that we have this relaxation of the mitigation measures, we see some updates in the active cases curves, and but also it's not as linear because there are also these uh, public holidays uh, when in which people decided to just uh, go out and travel and things like that, and after all of these uh, public holidays, we also see optics. So uh, the, uh, the control of the pandemic, uh, we have never really uh, gotten down in terms of the number of active, active cases. However, the authorities were uh, comfortable considering that we, have, uh, we weren't reaching hospital saturation. Unfortunately, since October, we have seen an increase uh, in the number of hospitalizations and the hospital capacity here in Mexico City is now around 4,000 hospitalized people, which is about 75% capacity of our uh, hospital system. So with that, what I, I want to say is that this citywide reactivation was suboptimal. We weren't able, um, because each time that we relaxed the, the mitigation measures, the cases went up. And there's also, I, I don't want to place all the blame on the authorities. It's a complex system, whereas people have relaxed it too, and we are kind of tired of all these restrictions. So people take the risk and go outside. But by now, the gains of the lockdown have been completely lost. Everything that we gained during, back in March, uh, it's, it's over. We, we have a lot of saturation of the hospitals again, but the authorities are arguing that it's not quite possible to go back to a second lockdown because the economic hit of the first lockdown makes it unfeasible to, to ask people to go back to their homes. So with that in mind, we decided to, to make use of these network approaches to try and figure out if there was some sort of alternative that we could use to, to reach this balance of having economic activity, but also uh, not having such uh, big load in the hospitalization rates and basically to try to control the pandemic a little bit better. So what we do here is what, that we take an empirical contact network of Mexico City, which will be the topic of my second talk. Uh, and then we use uh, this network to represent the lockdown and the reactivation stages as basically edge disconnections and reconnections. With that in mind, we can run uh, epidemiological dynamics over the network. And with that, we can evaluate the magnitude of peak cases after reopening, uh, considering different scenarios, which will, will be the topic uh, I'll be talking about now. So this empirical contact network that I, I was describing, uh, we generated using mobile location data uh, from the pre-pandemic period. I will not go into detail with this. I'll be talking to that, about that in about 15 minutes. Uh, but for modeling purposes, I, I wanted to highlight, we needed to have a smaller network because this is a very large network. So uh, we try to scale it down by identifying the modular structure using the stochastic block model, uh, the stochastic block model and then uh, trying to scale down each of the models to about 10% of their original size while keeping the original proportion of intra intermodule links. So with that, we end up with a network of about 10,000 nodes with which we can run these epidemiological models on top. So, this is the interesting thing. How do we decide to represent the lockdown and the reopening as network changes? So we have this network that it represents this uh, pre-pandemic contact, physical contacts between uh, mobile devices. So we consider that that network has the full length of the full set of possible links. And then um, when we go to the lockdown mouth, we consider that this is basically disconnecting a lot of, of edges from the original network. How many? Well, 
based on the uh, local authorities report that uh, mobility went down to uh, by 75 percent we uh, uh, extract a subset of 25 percent of the original uh, edges in the network and then once we have the reopening what we consider that happens is that uh, a fraction of the population would go back to the public sphere and once this fraction of the population goes back to the public sphere then all their adjacent no uh, all their adjacent edges will be reactivated because they go out again so they it's not just that they go back to meeting with their uh, workmates but also they will also go out and buy things and basically by stepping outside of their houses they will be participating of life as pre-pandemic times so sort of like the intuition behind it then once we have these networks we use the epidemics on networks the eon package by miller and ting to run the epidemiological dynamics on the network and this is a very uh, simple sir model uh, we take the, the epidemiological parameters which are published by the official mexico city model which is available online and to represent the heterogeneity in transmission probability and recovery rates and uh, all these heterogeneities that we know that are uh, happening in, in this pandemic, we consider that the parameters reported by the model are the mean of, an, uh, of a normal distributed uh, set of values. So we, each link has a transmission rate that goes, uh, that is centered between these, these uh, mean parameters. Uh, the model consider uh, we consider that the, uh, we start the model running on June 15th, which was the initial uh, day of the lifting of restrictions, and we consider that by June 15th we have a number of infected and recovered cases. So that's uh, we scale it to the size of the of the new network, and that's our our beginning uh, uh, state for the simulation. And now for each scenario, we run 100 simulations so that we have sort of uh, an, uh, uh, an area of scope of different outcomes. The model you can, uh, the more, for more detail, you can consult my GitHub where the model is, is properly described. So to have proper comparisons, we identify boundary cases which are the maintaining the lockdown period. And what we see here is that our main peak would be below 5%. And on the other hand, uh, what would happen if we just uh, went, everybody went back outside on the day of the restriction lifting. And what we would see is that the peak would have a magnitude of about 10% of the population. So the first scenario is considering our arbitrary reactivation. So basically everybody goes out uh, the people that go back to the public sphere are randomly distributed on the network. And we start considering a 5% of the population being reactivated since that was the number that the authorities consider that would be coming back to work at that time. And we see that the, the magnitude of the peak is still remains uh, below the 5%. So it's sort of like not so different from maintaining the full lockdown. But unfortunately, we know that uh, a lot of people uh, Economic reactivation is not just the workers going back to work, but also you need uh, people to go out and buy stuff and go to restaurants and so on. So we move to 10%, 25%, and if 50% of the population returned to the public sphere, then we would have the same effect that just lifting everybody going back to, to the public sphere. So our alternative is that we, instead of reactivating randomly, we reactivate a uh, model by model. One so minute. Uh, yes. One minute. Yes. Yeah. So instead, we reactivate mo whole models, and what we end up having with the, uh, this uh, is that the connections within the model are reactivated, and also the within uh, inter model connections are reactivated. By doing this, we can uh, even reach the 50% of the population reactivation without going to this back to these high levels of, of activity. But if we decided to reopen the models 
instead of going from the larger to the smaller, if we uh, reactivate models that are topologically distant, we can even have these uh, uh, dynamics in which the, the magnitude of the active cases is even lower than what we had during the lockdown period. There are some caveats of the model. This model is not uh, designed to be predictive. It's just uh, calibrated to be comparative between the different scenarios. And one thing that we know is that uh, the model does not consider further updates in the network, which has been the case because there have been uh, different steps of relaxation. So the idea here is to have these different uh, uh, and different alternative to, to have economic activity without having this uh, negative impact in the number of active cases and, and hospitalizations. But uh, translating this, the, the abstraction of the model to public policy is not trivial. So currently we are working with the local authorities on trying to identify how, what are the, the sources of this modular structure in the network and how can we translate this to public policy. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we had time for a couple of questions. Can I ask a question? Go ahead, please. Okay, so Guillermo, fellow Chilango and Rodrigo. Uh, so my question is with respect to, obviously you didn't speak about the modules, um, and I was wondering if they have some economic meaning. And the problem is that, as you know, we have all of the informal sector and as you discussed. So uh, this is a crucial one, right? It's, it's not like a super module, but it's, it's one that permeates obviously all of the other ones. So what do you do with respect to that, the informal uh, economic sector? Yes, so um, the models here, uh, they are just, uh, they, are, they emerge from the connections in the network. And I'll be talking about this in a couple of minutes, but they are not really representing uh, proper uh, economic sectors per se. So it's not like this is the module of shoemakers and this is the module of okay. Fiamis people. But we do have some insights on what are the uh, sort of driving forces behind these modules, which is the topic of my next talk. And so that's kind of the idea of what we are trying to translate. Well, uh, one of the things that I'll be showing is that some of these models are uh, due to uh, physical, uh, close physical distance in the residence place of people. So people who live together kind of form their models. Some of them are explained by that. So one idea is to just sort of force people to hang out with their neighbors instead of going, uh, crossing the city to, to go to economic activities, things like that. So yes, that I think that, for instance, in the case of informal sector, uh, the idea is that they don't travel too hard. If it's informal sector, but it's happening nearby their residence areas, maybe it's not that, uh, it doesn't have that much of an impact in terms of the, the epidemic curve, something like that. Thank you. And I guess we need to move forward, although the, the speaker will stay the same. So. Thanks for answering this. If, I, if anybody else has got questions, please reach out to the speaker uh, on a separate channel or by message in the in the private chat of Zoom. Uh, we now go to, again, uh, Guillermo de Anda uh, Horegi. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this talk will speak about the contact network of Mexico City. So the floor is yours again. Thank you very much. So uh, as I was saying, well, we uh, now I'll be describing a little bit in more detail the contact network of Mexico City. So as I said before, Mexico City is a very large city and it's very heterogeneous. Uh, and uh, then the question was, uh, how do people contact each other in Mexico City? And as I, I will try to convince you, uh, this has a lot of applications, but let's be fair, uh, the motivation to, to figuring out how people are contacting each other in Mexico City was driven primarily by the need to sort of identify uh, interventions to control the pandemic uh, uh, impact. So we wanted to get a contact network for Mexico City. And what is a contact network? What, what we are we calling a contact network? Is this a network where nodes represent people and the edges represent physical close contacts? 
So uh, in the case of COVID, we wanted uh, this context to be very close because that's uh, uh, what we know that is required for the, the uh, transmission of the virus. So of course, the, our original use case was for network epidemiology, but as we've been working on this, we've seen that there are some applications for sort of infrastructure planning, social studies, and so on and so forth. So what we want to do is to transform this observation of a daily of Mexico City life into a network model. And how can we do that? Well, there are many sources of information that could be used for, for this mission. Uh, Mexico City has these origin destination surveys for, uh, that describe how people travel from one location to another for work or relaxation purposes, but they are a little bit updated and the granular, uh, granularity is not very, very it's, it's very low, coarse grained, right? So there, there were talks about trying to implement wearable tags or to use dedicated apps, but unfortunately there was no political will to, well, it was very expensive to, to do that large scale, so it wasn't something feasible. And maybe yeah, I tried to use surveillance data, but there are some ethical concerns on of how you can access the surveillance data. So eventually we, we end up using a mobile device uh, data. So uh, mobile device data are uh, having used commercially for a long time. And usually what I do get is this localization data sets where you have the time and place where a device was. So sort of like an, a device identifier, a time and its Y location. Since mobile device use is widely adopted in, in Mexico City, uh, we don't really observe a, a problem of, of having sort of a, a, a not, it is a representative data set. That's what I'm trying to say. And data is collected passively because these companies aggregate and the, the, the phone companies aggregate this data. So you don't really need to install anything. People are just uh, being tracked uh, due to the use of, of the cell network. So, and the other important thing is that we can characterize these, these nodes because we sort of have these unique identifiers of the nodes. So even if we don't know who the person is, we can sort of use some tricks to cross information from other sources into the, those data sets. The limitations is that these data sets are really expensive. And I'm talking uh, th tens of thousands of dollars are expensive and they are very large. So you need a very dedicated infrastructure. Uh, one uh, private provider was kind enough to, to lend us this, uh, this data set for, uh, for academic purposes and for the COVID-19 response efforts. And so uh, the team uh, at Simba staff uh, devised this uh, pipeline that allows us to do very uh, different analysis of these uh, mobile data devices, including uh, calculating mobility measures, uh, obtaining these travel networks, identifying contact spots, hotspots. And my, uh, my main uh, contribution has been the, the work with these contact networks. So how do we reconstruct them? As I said, we have this information of the uh, position in time of the uh, mobile devices. So what we do is that we take Mexico City and we do a, a hexagonal tessellation using the H3 algorithm, the one developed by Uber. And we, we do the tessellation having these hexagons of about 0.9 uh, square meters so that we know that if two devices are in the same hexagon, they are actually quite close together. So they are useful or they are in this, what we consider a, a close physical distance, uh, which as I said before, is the type of, of contact in which uh, COVID can be transmitted. So what we do then is that in a 10 minute window, we observe which devices were in the same hexagon and if the devices were in the hexagon, then we sort of map this as a bipartite network in which one layer is the hexagon and the other layer is the mobile device. And what we can do then is that if we have all this tessellation of the city, something like this, then we have a, we can transform this position data into the bipartite network. And then we can do a simple projection 
to connect those devices that were in the same place at the same time, right? So we do this in time in 10 minute window intervals. And what we do is that we have this network, these networks for each time slice, and we can uh, aggregate them together into a single network that describes the connections within the people in the city for a given day. So for our initial uh, approaches, we reconstructed networks for February 2020, which is, uh, yeah, uh, yes, yes, yes. So it's February 2020, uh, which is pre-pandemic times for Mexico City. So uh, we wanted to have a representative uh, sample. So we, we analyzed four days, uh, four weekdays and four weekend days. Uh, of devices being located within the boundaries of Mexico City as defined by our uh, Census Bureau in Mexico. So we end up with a network like this. And something that is very important uh, for me to highlight is that uh, we released this data set uh, for, for these days, and it's uh, available here at the OSF in order for other uh, researchers to, to make use of it. And we analyze the different uh, days. And even though the networks are not exactly the same, as I was saying before, that these networks evolve. And that's something that we, it's very intuitive that we don't have the same uh, uh, connections with one and another every day. Uh, then what we uh, thought, they are sort of, uh, they, are, they are not radically different from one day to another. So for illustration purposes, I will be describing the network for uh, February 18th. And what we see is that this network has a heavy tail degree distribution. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, devices that don't really connect with each other. We have a lot of zeros and ones uh, in the degree distribution, a very little, uh, I think the, the highest degree value for it is there is about 4,000. So we have some people who have a lot of contacts where, uh, where, with, uh, throughout the day. The uh, related, the component size distribution is very heterogeneous. We see that the, the largest connected component ha uh, has uh, a lot of the nodes in the network, but there are a lot of smaller connected components. And this is important in terms of, of disease transmission because uh, we consider that uh, transmission, well, transmission is likely a, a, where there are infected nodes, but, and if this component is too large, well, they, they, that's more at risk, but the rest of the components are at risk too. Minute. minute. Yes. Um, I mean, one minute of time left. Yeah, thank you. So the network has a modular structure, as I talked before, we have identified this with different uh, shapes. I will go a little bit faster, but uh, as I was saying, we can use information, uh, we can cross information uh, uh, to the nodes, so we can identify uh, socioeconomic status information. And uh, by identifying where, what is the residence of the, of the node. So we keep it at the neighborhood level so we don't have uh, privacy issues. And what we see is that the connections are mostly uh, between people who live close by, but we have connections for uh, between people that live farther away. And one thing that we started looking into is uh, these connections that happen farther away, what are is driving them. So we looked into the income of the re of the neighborhoods and what we saw, so we contracted the network into uh, a new network that nodes has neighborhoods and links are, uh, whether they are connected in the original network. And what we observe here is that there is some sort of socioeconomic assortativity. So these connections between uh, people who live in a, a given neighborhood, they have uh, different uh, patterns. Some people, especially people from higher socioeconomic neighborhoods have connections only with people from the similar uh, socioeconomic uh, income, whereas people from lower strata uh, has connection with a wider set of people which is interesting uh, or it's important to us because we can orient uh, interventions based on this sort of information. 
So to wrap up, we, we have this large data set of, of information about connections in Mexico City. And what we're using it right now is to sort of orient uh, public policy interventions uh, and to tailor them to the different uh, sectors of society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two, three minutes for questions. I've collected a few. Basically, they're grouped into a couple of classes. The first class of questions is about the, the spatial resolution that you claim about this data. One localization at one square meter resolution is, uh, uh, is very fine. And, uh, and so uh, can you tell us more about how this information is obtained and how accurate it is, for example, if people are indoors? Is this based on GPS or CDR or XDR data? Can you tell us a bit more about this quickly? Yes, so this this data is collected for is aggregated by by this private sector uh, partner, and it's a combination of, of mostly pings to the antennas, but there's also GPS and Wi-Fi detection. So it's sort of aggregated into that. Regarding the resolution, that's an important uh, issue. Uh, not all the pings have a, a fine resolution. We lose about between 50 and 70% of the call set based on this spatial resolution, because uh, as we said, we wanted to have this uh, resolution at about one square meter. And so the, uh, the measurement of the accuracy uh, for, uh, we wanted to have the measurement of accuracy to be lower or, or shorter than one meter. And we don't have that many things that, that check that mark so we had to drop a lot of observations so from let's say uh, millions of observations we end with hundreds of thousands of observations i thank you and the second question is related to privacy in a sense and and this i i, I have to stress it because myself i am one of the authors of one of the privacy preserving proximity contact tracing protocols so materializing this type of data without explicit consent of cities and this is highly problematic according to me and other people who asked in terms of privacy. Can you comment on this? Yes, of course, privacy is paramount to, to our efforts. And of course, uh, there are two, two issues. The first one is that these are commercial data. So that information is already available and being distributed uh, throughout uh, by these companies, right? So um, sort of the, some of the issues are, are related to the commercialization of that, which as we we are maybe aware of, it's an open problem and let's leave it at that. So uh, the other issues, what can we do uh, while we're handling the data? We, we have just anonymized data. We don't really uh, know the, the identity of any of the devices. And even though we can reconstruct uh, sort of using this nighttime location algorithms to identify their their residences, uh, we try to keep it uh, at the level of aggregations uh, such that we don't really have particular identifying information for a given uh, subject. So that's why we aggregate everything to the next level, which is this uh, here statistical neighborhood areas so that we have just like average patterns of people and not uh, proper identificators. In fact, this has been one of the limitations of the contact tracing programs in Mexico City, because since we have a very strong data protection system in the city, then uh, we had to spend a lot of, well, the people who are developing that, which is other groups, but they had to, to walk very carefully with the legal teams in order to, to properly devise the, the protection systems. I think this would require a much longer discussion. However, uh, can I add, uh, like you're, you're effectively building and materializing uh, in a single place the, the, con the social network of encounters of, of citizens. And this object, this graph, we know from decades of work that it is impossible to anonymize, right? So even though you don't have identifiers, you can re-identify nodes with this information. And to me, the fact that this exists in commercial hands already is really not like you know, like this wouldn't fly in, uh, uh, in 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 many in many legal systems that have GDPR, for example. Yes, uh, I understand that the issue, and you are right. This is this requires a much larger uh, 
a conversation on, on, on whether what are the, the limitations and what can be done and, uh, in terms of properly anonymization. Yes. Okay, thank you. Do we have an, any other last minute question um, that doesn't cover these two micro classes? That's more on the science. And if not, I guess uh, we can uh, we can talk the speaker again. Uh, let me talk again. All of the let me thank again. Sorry, all of the speakers of this uh, of this second session uh, of the first afternoon of uh, the conference of complex systems. And with this, I think we can wrap up the session. And I wish you a good evening and a good uh, uh, prosecution of this conference. Bye, everybody. <laughs>